and we've been leading the fight to fight to save the psychotic herd of horses i'm sorry i just forgot i wasn't recording and had to record <laughs> <laughs> um, for people who want to watch this later so i'm excited to announce our guest today christine mcgowan she's from the preserve in chester springs pennsylvania for those of you who don't know who christine is let me tell you a little bit about this amazing lady Christine is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania with the BA in Fine Arts. She's committed to higher thinking and is a fearless supporter of truth and loyalty and light defined by the original Quaker ideal. These principles led her to be an advocate of the Nakota horse, a feral breed and original to North America. In 2012, Christine dedicated her 14 acre farm in Pennsylvania to introducing the Nakota and their colorful history to streams of visitors, clinics and individuals interested in native culture and the history of this heirloom, heirloom horse. Christine recently resigned as the interim president of the Nakota Horse Conservancy, where she continues to sit as an advisor. In 2015, Christine formed the 501c3 Preserve Chester Springs. As acting founder, Christine supports a mission and a strong hold for best practices towards sustainability for the remaining 300 Nakota horses in North Dakota. The preserve fundraises for special projects and is collected archival data, including DNA records, which connects the horses to the Lakota people and the great medicine chief sitting bull. The preserve is currently responsible for a 94 horse biobank genomic study in partnership with Cornell University. These genetics underline the supreme health and wellness of the relatively untouched and self-sustaining ancient horses of North America with endless suggestion of healing modalities for human beings, both physically and emotionally. Christine is currently collaborating with a team led by Dr. Bailey from Bryn Mawr College to produce Moving Hearts, Sacred Wisdom of the Nakota Horse. The book's goal is to link this healthy vintage herd with many successful leadership techniques, which can be applied to organizational health in the field of social work, families, community, as well as corporations and nonprofits. The first printing will be in winter of 2023. Christine's topic for today will be discussing the importance of the horse herd as a demonstration for healthy social systems, community, family, schools, workplace, and how the precision of a successful herd dynamic offers a great model for humans. Humans, Of course, this ideal is magnified by the floral horse like the Nakota, which shares the best processes as, as it has spent centuries in and out of domestication. Welcome, Christine. Oh, thank you. Um, thanks for having me, Chris. And I, I can't see all your names on here, but I wish I could be speaking in front of you in person. Um, I prefer to speak in person. <laughs> um, so I'll do my best. And then I think we're going to open um, this up for questions at the end. So uh, jot down questions for me. Um, and um, I really, I look forward to um, answering them, but well, and so I want to start by saying that I am first and foremost an advocate of the Nakota horse and um, the, the breed um, and the herds that I fell in love with were already pulled from the national park um, when I was introduced to them. And there's um, a really romantic story as to how I was introduced to the horses, but um, in the name of time, I'm going to like skip through some of this and just let you know that um, it the introduction completely changed my life. Um, and I have a huge thank you to Leo and Frank Koontz and Castle, Dr. Castle McLaughlin for um, having the uh, inspiration to uh, take some of these horses out of auction and create the herd that we we have today that's outside the park. Um, the herd that's inside the park um, is, is uh, the original herd um, that we celebrate. And um, each horse at this point, I consider a, a magnificent um, piece of history and, and should not be forgotten. Not one, not one horse um, is to spare. Um, and I'm gonna tell you why. <laughs> um, so, you know, and I and I wish, you know, I, I wish I had Leo and Frank standing next to me. I've spoken with them and um, it's always a pleasure, you know, to have them. We've lost, lost Leo and um, I hope I'll be standing next to Frank speaking again in the future. Um, but in the meantime, I want to start with something called fences. Um, and I thought a lot about how I was going to begin this lecture. And I, I want to, I want to, I want you guys to think about a time where there were no fences. Um, so there was a time where Theodore Roosevelt National Park was not a fenced in area. It was just, you know, 
part of our our um, natural environment. Um, and out west, I mean, obviously we have broader ranges without fences on the east coast, which is where I am. There are smaller and smaller areas and there are lots of fences. And the the one thing that uh, really stood out to me about the Nakota horses is that they really don't see fences. Um, there's, there's not an other side. Um, there's not a bipartisanship um, for, for a feral herd. The herd, um, in, in my farm, I have several fields and they're all around me and um, the horses live in, in different pockets. But I know I can see those fences and they're there for practical reasons, but the horses consider themselves a natural herd. Um, they, they, they don't operate as fenced in animals at all. And um, that can make a beautiful model for some of the things that I wanna share with you. Um, so, so imagining an area without fences, um, which is where the horses originally roamed, um, now, you know, we're talking about a herd of horses that we refer to as feral. And so one of the, um, one of the things that I had to understand is I, I thought of feral like a feral cat. So a wild, a wild animal. Um, but feral actually, um, by definition, refers to something that has gone in and out of domestication over years, many, many years. Um, and with that time spent in and out of domestication, the time spent in domestication um, and then coming out, they, there's been introduction to people, human beings, and a lot of the information gain gets recorded inside the DNA of the horse. And there's lots of very interesting studies about that. Um, but I would say that that feral nature brings incredible accuracy. Um, there's accuracy for decision-making, accuracy for precision, of um, life and death decisions. Um, decisions made by a feral animal are, um, they, take, they take that role very, very seriously. And with that accuracy comes um, a beautiful, beautiful benevolence towards the human being. Um, um, if, an, if, if a feral horse accepts you into its natural herd, it's for very good reasons and um, should be trusted very, you know, trusted intimately. Um, and this, so this heightened experience um, coming from a feral nature of these horses makes the whole experience on a therapeutic level very, very different. And so when I got interested in, in the Nakota horses, I was trying to convert my farm at the time into more of a therapeutic. Um, I was fascinated with the therapeutic quality of the horse in general, and I started with domestic horses, and a lot of them were rescues. Um, and while we had some success, I, I, it was nothing in comparison to the success that we saw when we brought the Nakota horses into play. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the, the accuracy and the feral nature, um, but it really... Um, my whole experience on the therapeutic level was heightened by that. Um, the other piece is that being feral brings extreme sensitivity to the whole process of the environment. So a feral animal is going to have um, a totally different sensitivity, just like um, some of our, what we call sensitive people or people who are on the spectrum are highly, highly sensitive. Um, like a fluorescent light might bother um, a sensitive person that doesn't necessarily have any impact on a regular person in a gym or in in a in a school setting. Um, the same we saw the same piece for the Nakota, and what we tried to preserve in our training of the Nakotas is that sensitivity. We try not to um, we try not to dull that down, um, which is on some level what I feel domestication does. So. So inside of that feral piece, um, I start celebrating the Nakota horse. And so this is why I'm, I'm, I, I can't say enough that each and every horse is 100% of value. Um, and I'll, I'll get into the, the herd quality of that. But um, I, you know, there are not that many of them left. The language that they carry is incredibly exquisite. It, it's a dialect I will, I will, I like to refer to it too which is a much higher order than the domestic horses have. Um, 
we've seen um we've seen domestic horses that come off of the racetrack or have been in the show ring grand prix show ring who are somewhat deflated and depressed and you put them in with a Nakota horse and their play drive comes back their life comes back and somewhere inside of that and Leo and I and Frank have spoken about this there is some piece of language that the ancient horse carries that um, is remembered in the domestic horse when the domestic horse is reintroduced to it. Um, we know we know from the field of social work um, that, and when I started this, that 90% of all of our um, communication is nonverbal. And of course I'm sitting here doing a ton of talking, but actually 90% is considered um, of the highest accuracy. It is now 95%. So the horse's communication with each, with each other, the flick of an ear, um, you know, the, the blink of an eye, the suggestion of a shoulder, there's so much language going on out there. And Leo used to talk about this a lot. He said that he noticed that even in the time that the horses that they had acquired had been bred and <clears throat> were forming a herd, even even out on their their land in North Dakota, that they were starting to lose some of their language, and and that's why you know going back to the horses in the park, who of course are experiencing people now in, in different machinery or whatever, they they still have a language that is highly unique, and is very very important to pre be preserved. Um, and I've experienced that all the way down the lane to having you know, um, a, an autistic child, a nine-year-old standing next next to one of our Nakotas. So I've experienced that wholeheartedly. Um, and um, that's something if somebody's interested can can ask me more about that. But we've had nonverbal 11-year-olds um, say their first words here um, with a Nakota horse. And by the way, when I talk about therapeutic, I'm not talking about hippotherapy or riding. These are our... our um, is sessions that take place inside as natural a herd as I can create on my 14 acres um, without getting into trouble. <laughs> um, and uh, where where the the um, individual is um, surrounded by the herd and has maybe one one to you know a year's worth of experiences, um, amazing and miraculous things happen there. So it's no wonder to me too that the Lakota people um, did not center their entire culture around the horse and possibly and most definitely around the Nakota horses, um, which is something that Castle cited in her work. So we have we have many reasons here why why we really need to you know have a, have a strong look at the Nakota um, and keep them keep them in our circles and keep them, and as natural a state as possible, um, which by the way is huge, huge challenge um, outside the park and inside the park. And thank God Chris is doing what she's doing inside the park. And uh, for people who are interested in the, in the 300 horses that are outside the park, um, each and every one of those horses is precious. And um, you know, if anybody's interested in how they can get involved or um, support the, those herds, please let me know or let Chris know. Um, so establishing that, um, I, you know, and now, you know, I have a little bit of a background in the therapeutic world. Um, um, and my, um, my certifications came from um, Greg Kirsten, who was the founder of EGALA, um, and quite ironically was booted out of his own nonprofit um, after seeing enormous success and he and he actually rebuilt his own um, to something called OK Corral. So he went from Egala to OK Corral. Um, and I I can't say enough about um, how every time I I introduce the Nakota horse to some of of the um, uh, the founding therapeutic centers or people who were interested in therapy or um, in social work or, or fields of uh, systems inside of inside of our, our communities, um, how astounded they were when they met the Nakota horses. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't prompt all of them. I mean, these are things that they experienced themselves either at my farm 
or when I brought people out to North Dakota and they experienced the horses out there. Um, I think with Dr. Bailey from Rimmar and I, I came to, a, you know, a huge aha moment was looking at um, a shift between celebrating uh, micro psychology to macro psychology and micro would be looking at say the individual horse or the individual person and then macro looking at like a community or an, a herd looking at the entire herd so if we can kind of imagine um, um you know like maybe 25 or 30 years ago, we were all running individually to therapists for support. Um, that was, you know, the pop was a popular strain. The there, There's a current field that is, and it's highly explored. And I th think Dr. Bailey is probably at the front of this, where we're looking at um, the success of the individual coming from the success of the the whole or the greater community. And that's where we started looking at the herd. So I'm I'm cutting out a lot of stuff, but I hope you guys are getting like sort of an idea. So, and by by community, we're talking about everything from corporate America and executive, ex, you know, executives who are struggling with you know or or challenged with leadership, um, politics, schools, communities, um, family systems, uh, churches. I mean, even my little farm has, you know, has its own community nonprofit, the nonprofit sector, a lot of, a lot of organizations. Um, and, you know, you see this in, in um, even at Wharton, you know, some of the top business schools in the world are really struggling with how, how to create a, um, longevity, how to keep turnover down, how to keep um, leadership in place. And what we what we were able to do is take a look at all of the all the passionate things that I I've just described in the feral horse, um, which is an animal that's gone in and out of domestication now. So this is not an animal that's like lived you know in the wild entirely. It's it's had bounces through time through long extended periods of time. Um, I think the oldest is probably the Boral Four people, and most recently would be us, but in the middle would be maybe the Lakota people has had um, successful moments. And, um, you know, there's there's a lot, <clears throat> well, the, the best, I would say that the best way to describe um, what we see in, in the successful moments of the herd um, are scripted by a woman named Linda Kohanoff. And Linda Kohanoff talked about the five roles, there's five general roles of a master herder um, and in so inside any feral herd, and that could be a horse, two horses, <laughs> um, up to 500 horses, you're going to see five distinct roles. Um, you're and and I wonder if um, I'm actually this is something I wanted to talk to Chris about to see if she saw this in the park because I've actually never experienced horses in the park themselves. But there's generally a dominant horse, a sentinel a lead horse, a nurturer companion, and a predator. And the predator horse, and I'm gonna start with the predator actually, because the predator is never a popular subject. I mean, who wants to like think of themselves as a predator? And, and actually the human being is a predator to the horse. Um, the horse is a prey animal and, um, and as human beings, we are, we are actually considered its greatest predator, which is, a horrific thing for me to imagine, but in the context of the five roles that support a, a healthy herd, it makes a little bit more sense to me. So as a predator, a predator would come in as a balancer. Um, they'll be the judger of, an, of available resources like pasture and space. So if the horses are grazing down an area, the predator will alert um, lead horse and and um, the lead horse will issue movement. Um, they will sparely and reverently end suffering of an aged or weak member. Um, not something that we really want to think about, but could be incredibly important to a whole herd. If you've got um, a horse that's dying or has a broken leg, and that could slow down the herd for a true predator, like a mountain lion or something of that nature, um, that could be a very sensitive issue. 
Um, they're particularly sensitive to energy drains. So um, they're not interested in power, which is very different than the human. Um, and they will win at all costs. So in in the in the predator's role, and and um we'll see this on, you know, when we talk about the dominant, um they they will they will end life. Um so what would that look like in a corporation? It would look like somebody clawing to the top or balancing space between a victim and a tyrant. Um it could be, um, you know, um, termination, somebody who needs to be fired in an organization of the predator would have to come in and do that. And, and it's 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 a like a not a popular um, task, but it can be important for a health, a healthy system. So I'll skip there. So the the neat the neat way to do a comparison is with a dominant horse. So, you know, when we think about a dominant horse, you know, immediately we, we think about um um, hierarchy, like a hierarchy to me comes to mind. And I do want to point out that in the five rules, this is a very linear hierarchy. It's not, there's not like um, the lead horse isn't at the top with a, you know, um, waving a staff around. It, it doesn't work like that at all. Um, in fact, um, you know, everybody, everybody has a role and each individual is supported in that role and has esteem in that role, which by the way, is missing hugely in our in our um, a human natural order. So the dominant horse will stop fighting when an aggressor backs off. And that's very different. We just said the predator will fight till the death. So the, the dominant horse will, will back off um, as soon as they see movement from an aggressor. Um, they do not fight to the death. They will ask for yield. Um, a dominance need a lot of space. I, I'm sure you have somebody in your life who, who just needs a lot of physical space around them. My dad used to wear a shirt that said, stand back 40 feet, which I used to think was very funny. But now, now I kind of understand that. Um, they will drive off a natural predator. Now, we're not talking about a horse here. We're talking about, say, a mountain lion or, um, you know, some something that would be, um, uh, you know, um, inappropriate to ha have in, in roaming with a natural herd. Um, the dominant is sometimes expelled from the herd for being too loud or having too much volume. Um, they push and drive and direct energy and they have a lot of protective energy. But with that protective energy, they can get too big. So that might be in our in our social order, a yeller, a shouter, somebody who has something really important to say, but just can't say it eloquently and, and they have to shout about it. An overreactor, somebody who overcompensates, um, somebody who's highly paranoid, who recognizes that something needs to be done but becomes almost paranoid about what's happening. Um, it could also be a, somebody with a prepper mentality. I don't know if you, you know if that comes to mind, but it could be somebody who's just constantly worried about like, you know, having, you know, hundreds of extra cans of food or bottles of water or whatever, and that would be a dominant. And that that would have just a little too high a volume for without balance, <clears throat> but they're very, very important to the natural herd. So the sentinel would be more like a bugle hark. And I have, you know, I have one of these at, at my farm in, in each order. Some of the horses have both personality traits. Um, and if you remove a horse from um, the situation, the the other horses will fill in so that there's there's automatically, there's never a hole. Um, you know, if, if there's another horse that's borderline dominant and the dominant horse has been removed for some reason, that horse's dominance will come up, um, which I find fascinating. Um, so, you know, even though we're talking about five roles, there could be 500 horses representing these roles. So the, the sentinel was, would be a bugle like, do, 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 you know, something's alert, alert, something's coming down the, the, you know, the pike or coming around the bend. So they're the siren alert. They have heightened awareness. Um, they're hyper, hyper vigilant. Um, this would be a person that maybe has um, more of a nervous tendency in, in, um, in, in a social system, could be a nervous person in your in the house. Um, they can also have a calm assertiveness though about them. Um, 
They're very good at sighting predators, and they are the ones that will alert to change in, in, um, in the environment or inclement weather coming. So that, and that's, that's very important information, you know, for the leader of, you know, leader in an organization might need an advisor like that. Um, you know, somebody who, who is looking around on social media, um, and, and notices something or a change, a change in, um, a, you know, a change in perspective or something that showed up on the news, that would be an alert for, for leaders, good leadership. Um, so these, these are highly, highly important. Um, um, they, they will carry an, it, um, this would be like the type of person too, that would, um, uh, suggest an intervention in, in, um, in a, in an addictive situation, if, you know, in an alcoholic situation, the sentinel might be the one that says, suggests that there be an intervention. Um, the lead horse, and she's my favorite, um, so it's generally a mare, um, which is why they refer to the alpha mare. Um, they have a lot of motivational energy. Um, they're very curious, but they remain hidden. These are not leaders that are, are marching around with a shirt on saying boss or anything of that kind. Um, in, in a natural herd, it can be almost difficult to figure out who the lead horse is. Um, she, she will be the last one to move her feet in a crisis, always conserving energy for a true emergency. Um, she has a follow me energy about her um, and she's alert, but she will continue grazing until it's an, until the absolute moment of exit. Um, they're usually very clear, kind and confident and um, they create boundaries for behavior without stress. So they will place each horse's feet in the herd with a flick of an ear or, or balance of their eyes. Um, and they are generally calm and charismatic. Um, the it's I have a mare here um, that was uh, born out of a lead mare um, in, in the Conservancy's herd. And um, Frank and Leo were very quick to point out to me how my mare carried herself in a very similar way um, to her name is Luna. She's one of the oldest horses um, outside the park um, that's that's in in the managed herds out there. Um, and she was always flanked by she had sort of an entourage with her. Um, and her head was generally down and looking between everybody else's legs. And it, if you didn't know, you might miss her altogether. Um, they um, the other horses will always protect her um, for her wisdom. And um, and her her leadership comes up quite naturally. I mean, she's not going to just get out there and win some prize fight and then, you know, get get to her leadership position. Um, she she'll be largely unrecognized from the outside, and she'll she will be the one to go back to grazing first as a signal to an end of a crisis. Um, so she has a huge amount of emotional intelligence. And the information that she passes on to the younger generations is highly, highly valuable. Um, so in a, in a, in a, like a, a community or a corporate church, um, you know, school system, that might be somebody who's um, the person who sets a strategic plan behind the scenes or pushes an agenda forward, or in a family might be the, the one that um, is always planning family vacations up ahead or holidays, trying to keep systems moving forward in a nice, calm, orderly fashion. Um, they might also be the conversation shifter if somebody gets too long-winded. So, you know, that, that, that can always come up. And um, the lead horse is generally quite creative. Um, and then there's a nurturer companion. Um, the nurturer companion is a very trusted, calm and kind horse. Um, they have expansive energy and they are very extroverted. Um, they will probably be the first one to walk up and say hello and give a little touch on, your, on, on their nose. Um, they sense subtle shifts in the herd and will make efforts to rebalance the herd. Um, so for an example, an orphan baby will be accepted by an aunt or a, fo a foster bachelor. Um, uh, they sense the mood of the entire group and they dislike competition and division. So they're always looking for harmony. Um, so 
um, and and that to me almost defines the natural herd. Um, they the, they absolutely despise division, um, and and that I can't I can't say that enough. And that division, it it what they're always trying to do is create harmony and systems that flow within the whole order. So from fifty five to five hundred horses. Um, because they're always looking for harmony, they can appear two-faced. Um, I have a lot of friends like this. <laughs> they're always trying to like keep everything balanced and you know, invite making sure everybody's invited to everything, whatever. Um, and they can be exhausted. Um, the the nurture companion can can get exhausted pretty easily. Um, they're also in a, in a human setting that might be a person who wraps their arms around way too much. Um, or it could be somebody in human resources. That would be like your classic nurture companion. So within those five roles, um, we see this show up in, in almost every um, group or um, so all, all our social systems. And so when people come out and have a look at the herd here, um, and I only I only have 11 Dakota at, the, at this point, um, but I, I have, I have this representation in all the horses, um, some some of them give and take a little bit. Um, and it is wonderful for people to have the experience of coming out and and I mean, we'll we'll have like 30 people come out and have discussions about what's going on in the herd. And um, and you do see it, you do see the order, you see things shift. Um, sometimes I'll create an a somewhat um contrived environment where I will like pluck one horse out and replace with another and you'll see that shift happen um and and um and i think a lot of people a lot of us who have horses have seen that in domestic herds everything i'm talking about does show up in in um domestic herds but it's much it's heightened in the nakoda um the language is is much sharper and um it, it you know it's um it's not as diluted i mean that's like the best way i can put it um so when you know with all of that information and i'm giving you the broadest overview um i had to ask myself okay so why so we we know why well why is this happening why does this show up for the nakota horses like it does and and i was absolutely fascinated with this um so some of some of the reasoning i think is because of that feral quality and, um, you know, whatever has been invested in, in their DNA over, you know, time eternal. Um, and I have, you know, I have, I have some guesses as to why, and, and, um, I'm hoping that science will catch up with me because, um, I am working on, on some of those, um, genetic projects that will uh, hopefully point us in a closer direction. I mean, I don't know that it will ever prove you know, what is the oldest horse in North America, but I'm not sure that even matters. What matters to me is that these horses are incredibly unique and, and highly, highly, um, um, they're highly precious to, to everything we understand. Um, and I will circle back to one thing. I have to put a flag in my head, but what I, what I did come across and it was one of the reasons why, um, is something, um, called heart math and i don't know how many people are familiar with this but um there there was a study done um oh gosh i don't even know i mean many years ago um and um we're we all have this understanding now that the, the hearts can actually they create a vibrational frequency that's quite impact you know has quite an impact um with that kind of work and heart connection and and you know this is this is a really soft language and it's quite beautiful but there was um a veterinarian and phd that got together and did some experiments on heart math with horses and what they found was that um if they put a belly band around the horse and a band around a person and now we're talking about domestic horses now um they found that within one one hundredth of a second, the heart rate of the horse and the person would begin to match from about a mile away. And this is fascinating information. And they did this 
you know, in a closed study and it, it's all published. Um, it was Dr. Ann Baldwin who did the work and, you know, this is something that you can look up and enjoy. Um, and if anybody has trouble finding it, please reach out to me because sometimes it, you know, it asks you to subscribe, but you really don't need to. Um, but basically understanding this, this heart matching and this heart rhythm, I started to realize, I was like, well, this is how the natural herd remains hidden from predators, right? So what happens is the heart and rhythms try to match and the fer the feral horse will do this um, to, the, to its closest predator. It will do its very best to match because that will create a hidden horse from the predator. What that does for the human being is creates a sense of belonging. What it does for the horse is it creates a cyber survivability instinct. It's a, it's actually, um, it's, it's a survivability characteristic that has shown up in the horse. And by the way, I'm, I'm 10 times more so in the Nakoda um, or in the feral horse. Um, and it, it is, it's a, like a remarkable, remarkable piece. So you, you can have now an appreciation for where this therapeutic lens is coming from. It's not, you know, we all sort of feel better around the horse and there's, you know, there's, a, you know, a million reasons why. I mean, there, you know, Ralph Lauren even stuck it on, you know, as his emblem, um, you know, it's a symbol of, a high, you know, aristocracy and wealth and everything you could imagine. But the, um, there is an actual physiological event that happens with the horse and the human. And, um, uh, you know, that's something that's quite private between the, the what I would call my, my clients and the horse. But th that natural result is a feeling of understanding and comfort. Um, while for the horse, it's protection and invisibility. So the horse doesn't show up and say, well, I'm going to do all this wonderful work for hum the human. Actually, being the predator, we, we come in and the horse basically is neutralizing us. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of amazing. I mean, so being the, so, and I'll, I'm going to actually read right from her report here, but she said, the heart is the center of the empathic arts. Um, it's a love center. So the heart is literally a practical approach to survival and adaptability of the horse and the human herd. It's a bridge narrowing the distance between the prey and the predator. That's, I mean, I, so there's your therapeutic significance on an extraordinary level. Um, the results of this mini experiment were so extraordinary and so superlative with the Nakota horses relative to other basic equine systems that they require great pause and focus. And that's a quotation out of, of the book that we're writing. Um, and I, I put that out there to all the um, master's level students that come out here who are working on their degrees in social work because it's that new a subject and it hasn't been explored yet, but it definitely explains for all the scientists that need to know why, it explains the why behind this. And the um, the magnificence of, of um, the Nakoda horse and, and how that happens, you know, for them and for us is, um, I mean, it's something that we have to explore. It has to be explored. And they, the horses can't disappear before we get an option to do that. Um, they, they, um, they have so much information for us. The thing I was gonna circle back to, um, in the, in the study that we're doing, and I, I'm, you know, leaving out all the genetic stuff, because it's all kind of interesting and very exciting. But the one thing, um, there was a woman doing the lab work from um, university, Utrecht University, um, who, um, her particular um, study was on immunology and the horse. And while the horses in the park have unfortunately had some experimentation done on them, we know that the horse is uh, over time will, you know, they will recover their natural selves and in, in their highest selves if they are left to their own devices. Um, the horses that Frank and Leo and Castle removed and that lived on as, a, um, as, as naturally a herd as possible or natural herds, they were, I think, three or four separate herds that, you know, have morphed um, into two over time out there have not had any 
um, vaccine or pharmaceutical um, intervention. When she did the genetic study, um, she wrote a specific report and entered a, a contest, which she won, um, highlighting the supreme immunology of the Nakota horse. It is they the, so now let me remind everyone that so one of the big problems with horses right now are their hooves, and they're they're basically falling apart. Um, they've been overbred. Um, the the you know the race horses have been overbred, and nobody seems to correct be able to correct this problem with the hooves. Well, the Nakota hoof is it? There is a physical example of a Nakota hoof at New Bolton, which is the student veterinary hospital um, at the University of Pennsylvania, um, which is basically the top of the top. There is it is an example for the students of a Nakota hoof there as what a healthy hoof should look like. Now, I mean, that's that's something worth noting. Um, and she and this woman also won this immunology um, paper on on um, on our horses. So that's that's another key piece. And when I talk about supreme health and immunology, that encompasses emotional intelligence, an unbelievable emotional intelligence that these horses carry. They, you know, are able to work with children, um, you know, on the spectrum. I have, I have, um, I have a, a savant, a little, a little boy here, um, who I, I can't get over what can happen between he and my horse rabbit. Um, I mean, it's, it's remarkable. Um, I, I mean, there, there's so much more to, um, to look into and uh, dive deeper. Um, and I don't, I'm not going to be able to do it all in my lifetime, but I hope that I can inspire the next generation that comes along to recognize what I'm talking about and take this information and run with it. And that's what I, that's what I um, have challenged um, the, you know, the socio the, the departments at, at um, Brimar College and some of the students that come out here because they're going to be, they're top in their fields. And a lot of this information is, uh, is unexplored, but um, the uniqueness of Frank and Leo's current herds having not had any insult from pharmacology is something in and of itself that should somebody should put a velvet rope around that entire project and protect it at all costs because it's one of one of the ultimate oldest terrestrials we have to look at so um and the horses have a great sense of humor which to me is is always like the highest intelligence um so I, I hope I've like covered enough information to get questions up because, um, you know, I, but I, I did want to give you guys a maximum overview and definitely have a look at the book when it comes out. It's, it's fascinating. We have my friend, um, Will Strongheart, he's a Lakota man who um, is one of the authors. We have a PhD student, Ryan Rose in the field of social work is one of the authors. And then myself um, representing the Nakota horses. I, tried to spit out as much information for them as they could dive into. And then um, we've interviewed, I think, 11 um, people in, in the um, Nakota community um, who've had experience with the horses, everything from trainers to just, you know, people celebrating their own horses. And then, of course, Dr. Bailey, like, presides over the entire thing. So, um, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Christine. Um, um, so I have a, I do have a question for you, I guess, to circle this back to the horses in the park. And this is something that when I was at the DC conference, I talked to just briefly to, um, Ross McPhee about, and I've talked, me and Frank have talked about this a lot since 2020, they haven't, they've only removed four horses from the park so then they upped the gynecon which kind of interferes with things but I we I feel like I always felt like for every Nakota horse you show me I can show you that partner in the park you know mm -hmm. I can say like this looks like this horse looks like that horse and I think that we get so wrapped up in the fact that 
the park introduced new blood that I think that the, the Nakota traits as a dominant trait, which is what these horses need to survive, is starting to come back stronger. Mm -hmm. And when I asked Dr. McPhee that, he said, um, those are still Nakota horses in the park. Mm -hmm. And I think that we miss that um, because they introduced new blood, because it's not, because, you know, some of them don't have the qualities that Nakotas do. They have the the horses that were brought in to, you know, give them bigger horses and sell better essentially. But um, so where do you think that everything that you're talking about then comes in? And yes, I do see the different hierarchies within herds and within the the bands themselves. You know, there's more dominant stallions over other mm -hmm. ones um, and then different mares and different roles that, you know, the different horses play. So yes, definitely see that in there too. But as a part of, and you talked about that too a little bit, the herd repairing itself, I think that that is what it's trying to do. Um, you know, it's just mm -hmm. still being um, used by the biggest predator they have. So, right. Well, so my understanding is, and actually Frank and Leo, um, they, they brought in crosses as well um, into their herds. And actually that, um, rather than diluting, I think that actually supports the higher traits that that we celebrate in the Nakota. So, um, and like you said, that I think Franco also said to me, he's starting to see the original traits come back. He thought, saw them change and now he's seeing them come back. And so those the strongest traits are like the gifts from nature, you know, um, uh, and I think, you know, Dr. Mafia is probably, you know, obviously correct about that. I mean, that then that is my understanding. Um, I, and I think as well, um, Dr. Ansick at, at Cornell said that, you know, I was incredibly worried that um, Frank and Leo's herds were going to be inbred. I mean, we we do see lethal white and there, you know, there is some, some of that going on. Um, however, he said that is really not uncommon in a smaller herd. And he was delighted to see that the horses were not inbred and that, you know, it was really the crosses, I think, that had a huge impact on creating that. So whatever was introduced in the park probably was, it, you know, it's not, not to the end. It's not like a leading to an end of the original horse, because as we know, like, you know, too much of the same can, I mean, that that's really a, a breeding problem in, in and of itself. Um, you know, um, and it shows up in different communities and area. I mean, you you do you do need diversity. The diversity is actually a key component. Now, whether that was done with a lot of foresight, I you know, but you know, the horses are going to want they're going to want to sustain themselves um, through the highest order. And whether that's you know the um, the um, interjected horses dying off, or maybe the, those horses just aren't strong enough, or they don't, they, they don't, they can't handle the weather. Um, but nature will tend to correct that in like seven year cycles. So I hope that answers. It does. And then the predatory stuff that you talked about, um, I think I'm asking, I'll ask this, in our situation in the park here, would that be the role of like the bachelor stallions that come in and take over bands from the older horses? It could be, or it could be if there's um if there's an older or weak member. Um, the, this was described to me one time that a, a predator horse will actually sacrifice himself if it's an older horse. Um, to slow down a predator from and allow the rest of the herd to get away. Um, so, you know, um, I think so. I mean, I, I do think, and, and they're, um, they're, they, and you know, it can look pretty rough. Like, I, I don't think it's a, a, it's not a gentle role and I'm not sure that we could always understand why, you know, why one horse like it has a harder time, like, um, climbing the social ladder, so to speak, and and maybe is even eradicated. Um, but the the um, the bachelor stud probably has a. If we could sit down and interview him, we probably have a couple good reasons why that was the case. 
you've also had within the herd in the park a lot of older stallions you know they've been culling the young horses over the years and just leaving primarily an older herd and now we're seeing because i think that a lot of people don't understand either stallions aren't meant to be banned stallions into their 20s um so now we have younger horses coming in challenging those older horses and i mean at some point i always say the the wit and the um knowledge that the older horses have gives way to the stamina of a younger horse um so we're seeing that and it seems like we've had quite a few targeted over the last few years but i think the thing that bothers me the most is that we have some bachelor some older bachelor stallions that you know end up training the younger ones and that's great to see in a social structure but some of these older ones like just can't function if they're not a band stallion, like they don't know how to do anything else or be anything else because they've done that for so long and they end up really just dying off. Mm -hmm. And it's been really sad. It's been a really hard couple of years with some of our really significant stallions dying. But I think mm -hmm. that that speaks to what you're saying too. And then the disruption that, you know, from culling and, and there, there haven't been any stallions to take over for them. So they've had to be stallions forever. And then now when they lose their band, instead of retreating back and playing their role in teaching the next generation to keep the herd going on they're just kind of going off and dying on their own yes and that that is a, we um that came up um you know frank and and leo and i had discussed that um you know like if you just or if you're simply taking a look at finances like within say you know uh, managing the smaller herd in the, inside the nonprofit the first thought was to call out all the older horses and i was like wait a minute i said that would be like a bunch of teenagers raising themselves they won't have any idea how it's done like how do you how do you uh how do you alert the rest of the herd about the weather? I mean, there's just things that, um, you know, or, um, you know, how they deal with different seasons. How do you deal with, I mean, there's so much that the wisdom that the older horses have. And, um, you know, that's where, you know, even the, with best of intentions, we have to be incredibly careful not to disrupt the natural order of things, um, you know, because, there's clearly these horses represent, and I didn't get into, into any of the history, but there's they're a very clear example of something that has survived and 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 they thrived from without a, any intervention or supplementation for right. a very long time. I don't know a lot of other um animals that could have done that, you know, and had had created adaptation processes and whatever else needed to happen, you know, um, and, and continue to sustain themselves. I mean, that's worth studying right there. Right. Yeah. But you're right. There's yeah. Intervention is not always a good idea. I think that on the other end of the spectrum too, then what we started seeing is that after 2020, when they couldn't, when they stopped removing all the horses from the park um, because of the pandemic, so like the first year we had, I think in 2020, we had like 40 some babies that were born in, um, in the next year we had half of that, but it seemed like, and I think that this is where it comes from. It's just my theory. They're used to their babies being taken anywhere from four months old to three years old. So generally at about a year old, any foals that were born into the herd are gone. So then as one mare started having another baby the next year some one-year-olds were being kicked out of their bands and i think that that's just what we put on them you know at one years old they just go they don't know where they go they just know they're gone mm -hmm. um so we had a lot of one-year-olds you know roaming the park trying to figure out life which was really you know a couple of them didn't survive which was really heartbreaking but i think mm -hmm. that that also speaks to the disruption in mm -hmm. in the dynamic on the other aspect on the other end yeah absolutely it would be like um you know kids trying to survive and you know in inner city by themselves on the street right and then we do see in other bands where um it's been fun to watch where the older horse 
you know, ends up being the babysitter to the sibling and things like mm-hmm. that. So, and, and then you just see that hierarchy grow. And then also too, for what you were saying about them remembering, they haven't done a helicopter roundup in this park since 2013. So we're like 10 years now. Mm-hmm. They do spray for weeds every year and they use helicopters for that. And every time the older horses hear helicopters, they do run their horses to a safe place. So yeah, they don't forget. They do remember. And that's information that they're sharing because, and I've seen like younger bands who are obviously oblivious to this, mm-hmm. um, just stand there while everyone's running past them. And they're like, what are we doing? You know, right. what's going on? Yeah. so yeah. That's, that's fascinating. I mean, that's, and it, it totally makes sense. Yeah, it totally makes sense. And, and, you know, I mean, you, you could look at that as a model for, you know, anything, you know, outside of the natural herd in, you know, in the human context, um, you know, it, and it show, it's, it's amazing how, especially the children here, um, there will, they will make some association with either like say a holiday or say, um, a, a, you know, children a child who like can't stand Sundays or something like that they won't necessarily remember why but they would remember that there's something that you know went wrong on Sundays like and you know whether you know and it's amazing how that kind of stuff comes up um and it comes up a lot standing next to a horse (laughs) we um we get criticized a lot for humanizing horses and I always say I'm not humanizing them I'm telling you what I see you can believe it if or not. Maybe I'm just a crazy lady telling horse stories. But um, I think that a lot of things that you talked about, I mean, really, I, and I've always said that too, we can learn so much if you just sit and watch the horses. I mean, they, the way that they interact with each other and just the beauty of, you know, like you said, the unspoken language that they have is just incredible. So I don't know if you have anything to say to that. I mean, humanizing. Well, I, I'll say the the one thing that I, because, you know, I'm, I end up being the equine specialist in, in these events. So you have um, usually, um, you know, a, a therapist, a trained therapist, you have, you have the, um, the client, the equine specialist and the horse. And um, what I see, and I, I, I always make note of it is almost immediately the horse is I will drop just below. And so now we, there's usually two adults, right? And then it, it's and very often it's a child that we're working. Um, but the horse's eye isn't right below the adult's eye. It goes right below the eye of the child. Um, and, you know, my understanding in that um, is that's, a, and I believe that Frank taught me this, is it you know, it's an immediate, like the the horse is putting themselves in a respectful position. They're low, you know, they're lowering their eyes and, um, and the eye goes right below the eye of the most vulnerable. Wow. Of of the herd. Yeah. Um, so I see things like that. I see, um, you know, you do see tons of licking and chewing and eyes rolling. And usually that happens at the end of the session. Um, Oh my goodness. I mean, I, I, you know, horses, I see them like literally wrapping themselves around, um, you know, children, like almost like you're giving them a hug. Um, they will connect to the child's energy really well. Um, which is, I always find that fascinating. Um, and, um, you know, it seems like that's, it seems like for the Nakota, especially that's of the highest order is to support the most vulnerable in the group, but also with like a little sprinkle of a sense of humor. Um, so, you know, it doesn't mean they're not pushing holes and like trying to like figure out like, you know, um, but there, there is a sensitivity, um, to the vulnerable for sure. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions? Take a few minutes and see. This is really fascinating. I really appreciate you doing this. Um, (laughs) And I'm hoping that you'll come and talk to us again. I, I, Christine and I recently met through Frank and spent, I think over three hours we were on the phone together that day, um, but there was so much that she has to share and I'm hoping that you'll come back and talk again and, um, and just share more of your knowledge with us. And we look forward to your book coming out and I'm really glad that you were here today. So oh, thank you. anyone has any questions, but thank you very much. And thank you everyone for coming and we'll have more of these announced soon. So thank you. Happy Sunday. Happy (laughs) Sunday. Thank you.
Everyone have a good day.